Nehemiah chapter 6. Um, we're going to look at that this morning. I, I sensed a call to ministry when I was, when I was a very young, young man. I was thir- 13 years old. Um, I had a, a radical encounter with Jesus at that time, and Jesus became more precious to me than anything else. I was, I was laid out on the ground as I was in his presence and felt like I could do nothing else but pastoral ministry and was awaiting that day. As a matter of fact, when I was 19 and 20, I thought that maybe God had passed me by because I wasn't a pastor yet. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, it's very hilarious. Charles Spurgeon, the, the great British preacher, the Prince of Preachers, said this of, of the ministry. He said, if you can do anything else, do it. Meaning that pastoral ministry is not for the faint of heart. Well, I've been plugging away for 33 years now, and I know I only look 33, (laughs) but, um, and if there's any gray hair, I owe it all to the ministry. In the ministry, I've seen some really good, and I've seen some bad, and I've seen some really ugly. Despite the ugly days and sometimes months and maybe even years, two things have held me. Number one, Jesus is more glorious and worthy of my every breath. That that has held me. And number two, If Jesus shed his blood for his church, it must be really important to him. And if it's really important to him, it should be really important to me. John Stott, a English Anglican cleric and theologian who has passed, a great writer of many books, He said this of the church, if the church was worth his blood, is it not worth our labor? The privilege of serving it is established by the preciousness of the price paid for its purchase. If it was worth his blood, is it not worth our labor? Paul the Apostle writing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, he says this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. This isn't a calling to pastoral ministry. This is a calling that every one of us has received if we're in Christ. He's speaking to every one of us who claims Jesus as Lord. It's a corporate call. It's a call for all of us to be joined together, which has been a work of His Spirit only, that we might walk in a manner worthy of His glory and His great name. Arthur Wallace is another Brit, I'm quoting some Brits this morning. British Bible teacher and author, listen what he said. He says, if you would do the best with your life, find out what God is doing in your generation and throw yourself wholly into it. So the question we might ask is, what is God doing in our generation? I would submit that He's doing the same thing he's been doing down through the generations, and that is calling a people to himself that would fear him above all else and live their lives for his glory above all else. 
don't know if you remember that far back, but six weeks ago as Pastor Norm opened up the series in Nehemiah in chapter one, he said this, he said, Nehemiah's story is our story too. Yes, it's a story about the rebuilding of walls, but it's also a story about the rebuilding of a people who come together by the grace of God, under the word of God, and are committed to the glory of God and to being a light to the nations. And he continued by saying, it's a story that displays in narrative form the call of the church which is being built up as living stones with Christ being the cornerstone. It was the fear of God we saw last week that was Nehemiah's motivation to confront the broken down ways of God's people. And this week we will see that Nehemiah's motivation for completing the rebuilding of the walls despite increased heavy opposition is that same fear of God and the glory of God's name. You see, something's gotta hold you in the midst of opposition when it comes. Otherwise, you're gonna buckle, you're gonna give in, you're gonna give up. And it's more than just suck it up, buttercup. Have you ever been told that a few times? I remember I was going through one of the hardest times in my pastoral ministry and it, it moved from uh, really, it really hurting me and struggling to I was wallowing in self-pity. And my wife looked at me one day. <laughs> don't you love your wife if you have one? If you don't, you should get one. No. <laughs> She looked at me in all wallowing in my self-pity and she said, suck it up, buttercup. And then she continued to give it to me and she preached the gospel to my soul and I was a new man. <laughs> and that is not the only time she's done that in 36 years of being married. Now where was I? <laughs> should never go off your notes because um, what's holding Nehemiah in this text we're going to look at today? It's the fear of God and it's the glory of God's name. So let's look. Let's look at this chapter. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors and the city gates. Sanballat and Geshep sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand, and in it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to be become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is a king in Judah, these rumors will be heard by the king, so come, let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind, for they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Metet, Mehetable, who was restricted to his house, he said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. 
I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done and also the prophetess Nodiah and other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. The wall was completed in 52 days and on the 25th day of the month, Elul, when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Era, and his, and his son Johonan, Honan and had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. These nobles kept Tobiah's good deeds to me. Uh, they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray this morning you'd come by your spirit. I pray with the psalmist, would you open our eyes that we would see wonderful things in your law, and may we leave this morning uh, saying what a great savior. That we would love Jesus more because we gathered and we sat under your word. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Verse one, we read, when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard, heard, take note of that word, that I had rebuilt the wall. News travels fast. News travels fast, especially among our enemies. When you're actively engaged in kingdom work, the enemy always hears about it. He always hears about it. In verse two, Nehemiah's enemies say, come, let's meet together. And anytime our enemy is wooing us and saying to us, come, their intentions are always bad. The enemy's intentions are always bad. I heard a, a, an old preacher many years ago said of all of Satan's apples have worms. He will never have your best interest in mind. Nehemiah says they're planning to harm me. So verse three, so I sent a messenger to them saying, notice that Nehemiah is replying. He replied, I'm doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Now, I love what Nehemiah says here. I'm doing important work. The importance of work, it speaks of high value of the work he's doing. It speaks of, of there's, there's vision, there's, it's costly work, it's time consuming, it requires energy and effort, and this work is so high in value that I will not come down off the walls. Like Nehemiah, the call of the church is to live out Jesus' mission, and, and that mission is our work as a church, and it is important work. This high and holy calling is important work. This high and holy calling requires high value. It requires that we value it highly, that we, that we put time and energy and effort into it. Only the fear of God and the glory of his name will cause you to see what you do in the kingdom as important work. I want to ask you a question right at the outset. Are, are you convinced about this? Are you convinced that kingdom work is important work? I think, I think we need to be freshly convinced of that on a regular basis. Some of you are here this morning and you've, you've had a bad church experience, maybe several bad church experiences. Maybe you're sitting on the sidelines because of it, not involved because you've lost sight of the importance of kingdom work. 
Maybe, maybe you've been burned in the past, and if I had a show of hands, I think I would see many. When you think of throwing yourself into a local church, working along other brothers and sisters side by side, rolling up your sleeves to do kingdom work, it, to be honest, it freaks you out a little bit. And then there's the opposition that you're assured of because our enemy doesn't want to see God's kingdom advancing or being built. He's been opposing God from the beginning. He's been opposing God's work from the beginning. Some of you have heard the opposition say, come, let's meet together, and and you're seriously considering laying down your tools, laying down your weapons, and, and sitting across the table from the enemy. You know, we hear, we hear a lot in this day and age of deconstructing. And I, I've walked with Jesus a long time. I think I've deconstructed more times than I, I can imagine. It's not, it's not a bad thing to deconstruct from time to time. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We, we should deconstruct. But in a sense, when, when you start to deconstruct and you're going through something and you got big questions, whether it's about the church or your involvement in the church or the kingdom of God and kingdom work, when you start pulling threads, when the final thread comes and whatever's at the end of that final thread needs to be Jesus. It needs to, you remember the disciples in John 6 when Jesus gave this crazy teaching that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me and, and it says that many left him and he looked at his disciples and he said, are you gonna go too? And what did they say? They said, where are we gonna go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Something has got to hold you, and it's got to be more than than people that you like at church or your community group or whatever, name it. It's got to be something deeper and bigger and greater because opposition, if you're not experiencing it now, it's coming, and opposition will cause you to say, hey, why don't you get down off that wall, and why don't you come, and let's have a conversation. What's going to hold you and say, no, what I do, the work that I do is important work? Some of us are are too busy doing other work. And we've actually convinced ourselves that what we're doing is more important than God's work. And, And it shows What's at stake if we quit working and we come down? I think, I think most importantly it shows how little we fear God and honor his name when everything else in our lives is just as dear to us as, as he is. Often We just listen to the messages from the enemy and we fail to reply. But notice Nehemiah speaks to his enemy. I think we need to speak to the enemy and remind him of what we're doing, that this work is important work. And and not to think for a moment that when we do that, it's going away. Notice verse four, four times, verse four, four times they sent me the same proposal. Let's, let's, Let's call this plan A. So the enemy sends him a proposal not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, and I gave them the same reply. <laughs> okay, so this, you think, okay, this is good, but then verse five, Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time. Let's call this plan B, but the fifth time is with a twist. It's not, it's not the same, it's different, it's got a twist. Then verses six and seven, we, we see plan B. I mean, verses six and seven, let's look at that for a second. Um, and it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. 
This is the reason you are rebuilding, you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up uh, the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there is a king in Jerusalem, in, in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king, so come, let's confer together. Verse 8, then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them, inventing them in your own mind, for they were all trying to intimidate us. Listen, the enemy was thinking in their mind, if we, if we do plan A, plan B, we just keep going at them, Sooner or later, they're going to drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. Oh, can I tell you that we have an active enemy right now that wants us to drop our hands that the work of God would never be finished? I mean, that's the goal of our enemy, to stop the work so that it would not be complete. And and Nehemiah understands this and he cries out to God, but now my God, strengthen my hands. Oh, how we need God to strengthen our hands. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're like fired up about Jesus and you're fired up about the important work he's called you to, to to walk in a manner worthy of of, of, of the call that we've received and to be part of the family of God and to give your life away for this mission. I don't know where you're at in that. But I know this, that we desperately need to be crying out on a regular basis, God, would you strengthen our hands? Running to Christ on a moment-by-moment basis, asking him to sustain us in the fight. This is what we see the psalmist often doing, crying out to God for help and strength amidst the struggle. The enemy is always sending messages, always wanting to intimidate, always wanting to discourage and condemn. The Bible calls him a liar and a deceiver. He's crafty and he's always trying to stop the work of God. The devil wants to stop God's work and he will use creative tactics, tactics, but they are all lies. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 reminds us that we are not ignorant of his devices or his schemes. In Nehemiah 6, and we've seen it in previous chapters, that Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem are the three main enemies mentioned. And I would submit to you that, that our three main enemies are the world and the flesh and the devil, the world, me, and the devil. And these enemies have a particular relationship to one another in the fight against God's work being done. In the Gospel of John, the devil is called the the ruler of this world several times. He governs the world's system by trying to hide the truth about God. In 1 John 5.19, we know that we're, says this, we know that we are of God and that the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. So the world is under the sway of the evil one. The world is a system of thoughts values, ideas, and actions that are in opposition to God. The world system rejects God and his word, and it rejects God's people if you are one who loves God and loves his word. Don't think for a minute that the world will love you if you love God and you love his church. So there's this hostility between the world system and God. So much so that to embrace the way of the world is to adjoin the world in opposition towards God. That's why we hear in the scriptures, you are in the world but you're not of the world. And in John, 1 John 2, we're not to love the world nor the things in the world. Yet yet the world is so appealing to our flesh. It's 
so appealing to me. Satan uses the world's systems to, to tempt our flesh. And so, what's to be our strategy for fighting these three vicious opponents? Well, Scripture seems to be clear to say that we're to kill the flesh, we're to hate the world's system, and we're to stand against the devil. And we do this by fearing God and living for the glory of His name. We tell our enemies often that the work that we are doing is important work. In verses 10 to 13, we have plan C. You see, this is just relentless. It's not, it's not letting up. Nehemiah's enemies are now seeking to attack his credibility. He goes to the house of Shemaiah, who is supposedly restricted to his house, but obviously not because he says, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple and let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. But notice that because Nehemiah fears God and he knows that only the priests can enter the temple and so he says, I will not go. And because of this absurd ask, Nehemiah is convinced that Shemaiah was not sent from God because his words didn't line up with God's words. He was a false prophet hired by Tobiah and Sanballat. Uh, Just to pause here, people of God, we need to beware of the false prophets whose words don't line up with this book. And there, they are there in abundance and they are saying to us, come. You want an easier way? (laughs) There's, There's no such thing as an easier way in this book, is there? I mean, have you read it? It's just... There's nothing easy. Take up your cross and follow me. But there's so many other gospels out there being proclaimed that says there's, it's a whole lot easier than what you're doing right now, pal. Verse 13, he was, he was hired, Shemaiah, so that I would be intimidated do as he suggested, sin and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. Listen, the devil would love nothing more than to destroy your witness. The devil would love nothing more than to destroy Midtown's witness. What appeared as care or concern on the surface was the desire to have him sin and and get a bad reputation. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. I know a pastor who had been married 35 years and his wife had labored by his side and loved the church, served the church faithfully. She was having a bit of a tough time and went to see a counselor. She saw a counselor a couple times and it seemed like it was good. On the third or fourth time, the counselor said, you need to, you need to quit thinking about everyone else and every, all that you've been doing. You just need to think about you. You just need to do something for you and you need to live for you because you've been living your life for everyone else. I mean, it doesn't sound too bad. I mean, yeah, it's it's bad, but you know, like, do you get it? Like, sometimes we need to just pull off the the road sometimes and go golf. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, for golf. So she did, she, she ran off on her husband and had an affair and full blown into doing stuff for herself. The 
There's a lot of voices out there that are saying, come down. All that giving and pouring out your life and serving and laying it down for kingdom work, are you kidding me? Psalm 73, Asaph is looking and he's seeing the wicked. He's like, surely I kept my heart pure and vain. Look it. They're, they don't have any trouble. It just seems like everything runs smoothly and beautiful for them, and then look at me. Throw it all away. Go ahead, live for yourself. Because Nehemiah fears God and the glory of his name, plan C doesn't work either. Oh, I, I wanna be a guy that Plan C and D and E and F and G and all the way to Z and then back in A every time. I want to be the guy that, that all those plans fail. It's the fear of God. It's the glory of God's name. It's the fuel that's driving the important work. And as opposition is piling up, he's not moved. He's, his gaze is fixed. Verse 15 and 16, the wall was completed in 52 days on the 25th day of the month, Elul. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated, lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. We're, we're a fairly new Church, I think we could, you know, if I did this little thing right now, let's just think of all the evidences of God's grace in the first year at Midtown, and I just got to show hands. It would go on. It could go on for hours, I think. Just retelling the stories of God's grace, God's kindness, God's, God's blessing upon us, God's goodness on us. Listen, Midtown. Every step we take and everything we accomplish in this ministry and in our work for the Savior, it is all of grace. It is all of grace. If you are still on the wall and you are saying, I will not come down, you're not doing that because you've pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and you said, I got standards and things and I'm just, no, you've, you're doing that because the grace of God is holding you and preserving you and enabling you. Fifty-two days with no excavators or bulldozers. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. 52 days, remember chapter three? Remember chapter three, how many times we heard these words next to them? Remember that? Perfumers, goldsmiths, rulers, priests, temple servants, merchants, Shalom, the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, along with his daughters. This grand vision, this something had gripped them and it was greater than themselves and they said we wanna fear God and we wanna, for the glory of his name alone, we wanna build this thing and by God's grace they built the walls. What a beautiful picture of the church. The people that God has chosen from every tribe and language and people and nation come together to make Jesus known. That's what this is all about. And listen, when, when people see, when, when God is doing what God is doing and the world looks in, it comes down to this, that this could only be accomplished by God. You know, the, 
the song we sing, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I, I can't give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. If you are here this morning and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, his wounds have paid your ransom, and that's why you are in this place, and that's that's why you are doing important work. And may our important work draw attention to the Savior where people, what is Psalm 40? I love it, it says, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's what we want to have happening. Like Nehemiah, we need to fear God and live every moment for the glory of his name. And then we need to speak to our opposition, to the world, to, the, to our flesh, to the devil, and say, we're doing important work and we can't come down. And as I close, we can only do, we can only do this important work because one, one greater than Nehemiah appeared many years later. And in John 6, 38, we read this, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we read in the Gospel of Matthew these words, they stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and placed a staff in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. And on the cross, we, the opposition continues, and we read this. And those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, listen to these words, come down from the cross. In the same way the chiefs, priests, and the scribes and elders mocked him and said he saved others but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Here it is again. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. He didn't come down so that we wouldn't come down. Had he come down. Somewhere there's a text that says he could have called a legion of angels in an instant, but he stayed there and he says, the work that I'm doing is important work. Because of that important work, we read in Hebrews that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. We read in John's Gospel on the cross, Jesus said this, it is finished like the wall that was built in 52 days. Jesus said, it is finished. After completing his work, three days in the grave, he ascends, he appears to his disciples, and he tells them to go and wait in Jerusalem, in the city 
where the walls had been rebuilt, where the people of God were, where the name of God was feared. Go wait. And the promise was to send His Spirit to empower them to witness. Send His Spirit to empower them to stay on the walls and do important work until He returns. So what are you doing? What are we doing? Is kingdom work important to you? Because the Savior shed His blood for you. He shed his blood for me, and if it's important to him, then should it not be important to me? I, I, think, I think many of us need to repent. I, I, I thought last week was, I was all done repenting, and then this week was like double whammy. <laughs> I mean, I think it was Luther that said the Christian life is one of repentance. So we just keep repenting and keep being amazed at grace. You know when you're really jacked up about something? Like, you think about things that you just like, if I found that sweet spot for you and you're not even talking, if you're not that kind of person, but all of a sudden I hit, hit the right thing and you come alive and you start talking about that you know that like what is it is it is it the savior and is it his important work does that does that move the needle at all for you or is there apathy is there is there Is there pride? The last couple verses in this, this chapter speak of opposition continuing, even though the walls are rebuilt. And, and here we are many, 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 many years later and opposition has still not stopped and it will not stop until Jesus returns. So we need to fight. We need to fight the devil. We need to fight our flesh. We need to fight the world. And we need to communicate on a regular basis. There's something that's holding me, and it's the fear of God, and it's the glory of his name, and I will not come down from that wall. As we close, I want us to take a few minutes to just quiet ourselves and me not talking and no one else talking and and let, can we just take a couple minutes I, I felt like when I was preparing that sometimes we move too quickly and we don't let it land and so if there's specific conviction this this morning you need to you need to thank God for that his love for you and you need to repent So can you do that? Just take a couple moments right where you are and let's quiet our hearts before the Lord before we transition to the Lord's Supper and singing together.
Father, I'm aware of how easily I drift and I'm convinced that, that I'm not much different to many of my brothers and sisters. I'm aware of how quickly I am okay with sitting down with the enemy dropping my sword and my tools and loving the things that crucified you. Father, I pray that you would awaken our hearts in a way that we would fear you and our life would be about the glory of your name. I pray for young people in this room. Lord, for a couple months now, my heart has been so burdened for the young men in this church. Just a deep ache in my heart because of the pull of the world the longing to, to say, why, why would you give your life away to, to that? Many of them have grown up in the church and, and because they've grown up in the church, that there can be this temptation to think that's, that's what it's all about, but it's not. It's, it's, it's about you, Jesus, and, 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 and the need for them to encounter you and to see you and to behold you and to and to say you're worthy of everything. And so I pray for the young men, I pray for the young ladies in this church. Don't don't let the next generation be be missing or gone, but let them be the ones that are are leading the charge, that are so fired up about the, the glory of your name and they fear you and they they love you above the rest. God, forgive us for hearing words like this and then moving on right away. Let it land, let it sit in our hearts, let us us mull this over, let us change us. We we don't wanna be people who are just listening and then there's no transformation. Transform our hearts. God, we want this neighborhood to to not go, oh, that must be a cool church. It has cool people. They have cool music. They have cool this, cool that. No, we want people to say, what is going on in that place? There's something glorious. There's something about those people. Obviously, the one that they worship is worth worth worshiping. He's worth every portion of their life, every part of their life. God, to do something in us. Forgive us. Do something in our hearts. And as we come to this table this morning, help us to remember, (laughs) you, you didn't come down. And because you didn't, on our worst days of sin and failure, we can approach you and you love us no less. And that's my motivation to want to love you in reply. Because you love me in my brokenness. Oh, let that motivate every one of us in this room to want to walk in a manner worthy of the call that we've received. We pray this in your great name. Amen.